I always like to look for any sort of relevant science that is available to support sure. these crazy claims I'm making. Um, <laughs> they are measuring that we do have this bubble around mm. us. So I have a bubble and you have a bubble. And in the middle where they intersect this middle piece is a third thing that's created from the union of two people. And mm. that middle piece is intimacy. Hello and welcome to the Go Encourage podcast, where I talk to real people about real life, trying to gain some insight from their experiences around courage. This episode is part of our relationship series and today we are looking at intimacy. So on that note, I have invited my esteemed guest who is Catherine Smilis, uh, an intimacy therapist based out in Austin, Texas, who'll be joining us today. So I'm really excited to see where the conversation goes. So, hello, Kat. Can I call you Kat? Yes. It's Catherine, though, isn't it? It is. Which so means Kat is a. Ooh, go on, go on, go which on. means which means uh, it means pure. <laughs> is that right? Catherine means pure. Yes. That's a great. That's a great meaning for a name. And my middle name is Melissa, which I was curious in your questioning of what does Melissa mean, and it means honeybee. So honey pure bee. honeybee. So for people who are listening in, um, where are you from? Can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up? Where are you right now? Yeah, where I'm from. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Indiana, just near Chicago. And then I was a traveling therapist. So I lived all over the United States and I landed in Austin, Texas for the past four years. Wow. So I now live in Texas. <laughs> Texas. I've never been there. Heard really good things. Austin is like a little pocket of weird, of people who are doing entrepreneur things, pretty spiritual, and I would okay. say just really chill. Austin is its own little island of strange. <laughs> right. Okay. Strange. Interesting. So not very, well, it moves away from the mainstream. Yeah, people all seem to be doing their own thing here. Okay. You, you mentioned the word mm -hmm. spiritual in that as well. Is that something, Is that is that, are a lot of people, would you say, in that little pocket of the United States in touch with spiritual things? Yes, for sure. I think there's lots of spiritual communities, um, like plant medicine is very welcomed here. I shouldn't be saying that out loud, but it is. <laughs> Um, so lots of people are having awakenings here or joining spiritual communities. Mm -hmm. Um, they, it also, I've been, I lived in Sedona for a little bit while I was doing a rotation. Sedona, Arizona is a very magical place and it is mm -hmm. said to have lots of vortexes in it and energetic vortexes of be able, you can go to different areas in Sedona and feel this like frequency of something and I think that there's okay. lots of places in Austin that have the same sort of vibe, but not as pretty as Sedona. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's a lot there to unpack. Yeah. <laughs> I, want, I want people to get to know you first. Hold on. So we'll, we'll pause that for a second. <laughs> okay. Um, growing up, did you grow up with siblings? Um, can you yes, tell us a bit about I, your family? Mm -hmm. I'm one of five. I have three sisters and one brother. I'm the second youngest. And okay. my uh, job, my chosen job as a little kid was to be the mediator and the peacekeeper of the household. So I got wow. really, really good at feeling the frequency of the household and being able mm -hmm. to navigate or position myself in such a way to create more harmony in the household. So mm -hmm. my earliest memory of intentionally doing that was like seven. So uh, that has wow. led me to the career I'm in now, which is a therapist. And so I'm very good at being able to determine um, maybe if there's some hesitation in the way that someone is speaking, if there's an underlying something that I can just be curious about and ask questions about. And it makes me very successful in my career. <laughs> was that was that a natural progression or did you sort of have to put some intentionality into that? 
it kind of came from just being vulnerable and, and open with people that will probably resonate with this. Um, having five kids in a family mm-hmm. where the we didn't have much money, so there was a lot of stress and between my parents. And so I kind of took on the role in like a trauma bond sort of way uh, okay. because it was like, oh, um, I don't necessarily want to have to be the adult in the situation to navigate and mediate and peace keep. That's not a job for a kid. It's a job for an adult. Um, but I stepped into that role just because it was what was needed. So mm-hmm. there is that piece. And there's also I am a double cancer. So my sun and my moon <laughs> are in right. cancer. Right. So I I think innately I'm just more um, attuned to the emotions of myself and others. And then mm-hmm. I jumped into a chosen family dynamic. I believe you kind of jump into the situation that you are born into, specifically to learn different things about your immediate environment. So I think I chose to jump in there because I knew I could handle it. And yeah, I just, it was partly intuitive and partly meeting environmental rest- uh, constraints and the container of my environment. What kind of a therapist are you? If you gave yourself, what's your title? What kind of therapy do you yeah. provide? So my background and my schooling, I have a master's degree in occupational therapy. And mm. most people are like, what the heck is occupational therapy? And we are the therapists that um, are looking from a biopsychosocial framework. So we help with Anyone that's unable to do meaningful task during the day. So a psychologist usually stays in the mental, emotional capacity. A physical Mm -hmm. therapist focuses on the body. Um, An occupational therapist is kind of a beautiful marriage of those two professions. So we deal um, a lot with the psychosomatic experience. So how thoughts affect your body and how to be able to work with the body um, to express trauma, to um, rehab, to do a specific task that you're needing. And we also, it's like really wide scope of practice, which um, I took it in the direction of being an intimacy therapist. So I Mm -hmm. specialize in looking at the dynamics of families, of relationships, and being able to take all those pieces, your biology, your psychology, and your environmental factors and see that it makes a whole person. And then how does that affect your dynamic with others. So I kind of formulated a career based off of my own strengths and skills. Um, but yeah, it's a, there's lots of interwoven pieces to it for sure. Was it, was there a defining moment in that journey where you were like, okay, you know, this affects the, the wellness in a holistic way. Uh, and was there sort of a revelation moment for you to go, this is this is an area that I can contribute to and, and serve. Yeah, for sure. I worked in the hospital for five years um, and had multiple years of doing uh, probably about seven years of with clinicals and stuff. So I've been in the hospital system for a while. And I remember my first day walking into the hospital saying, oh, my gosh, this is not where healing happens. <laughs> I'm like, the hospital setting is super sterile and doesn't seem like people are super, like very connected in the hospital. And I got to spend a lot of time with people who are very ill. Maybe they had post um, heart issues, heart attack, quadruple bypass, um, so surgery, strokes, all of these things. And I would spend a lot of time in their most vulnerable moments where they would tell me, yeah, I mean, I've been very isolated and alone for a long period of time. My relationship is not great. My family life's not great. I live alone. I've been really stressed. I don't have many connections or friends or loved ones. And so in their vulnerable moment, I started to see there's a correlation between their emotional state um, before all of the serious things happened and where they ended up. There's lots of people in the hospital that get very ambiguous um, diagnoses because the doctors don't know like what's wrong with them. Mm. And there's a huge psychosocial, uh, psychosomatic reason why they're having these symptoms. But again, Mm. in the Western medicine, medical approach, we don't really understand that something that happened 
in the home environment when, you know, there wasn't any illness present actually is a really huge contributing factor to their illness in the current Mm -hmm. state that they're in. So I was like, oh, I think if I start to work on people's state before they have that chronic prolonged um, trajectory of being Mm -hmm. ill, then I can really change the course of somebody's life going forward. Mm. So then that took me into studying epigenetics and psychoneuroimmunology, which are just the study of how your thoughts and emotions create this cascade effect in your body and then start to either turn on gene expression towards illness or make you a more healthy person. So I first started off and I'm like, great, I'll do mental health. I'll work on, you know, that aspect. And um, I found that like lots of people didn't want to talk about it because it was mental health. So there's that Mm. word, mental health. Then I'm like, all right, I need to be a little slick here. How do I create (laughs) messaging? Be creative, Um, yeah, yeah. Yes. So I started talking about, well, if you're in these states of isolation, loneliness, depression, sadness, stress your libido and your desire for intimacy is also highly correlated. So I'm going to go in that route. So intimacy therapist was born off of the realization and recognizing that all of these things actually are the biggest effect on someone's ability to connect intimately in a relationship. Mm. And we're going to, we're going to unpack a lot (laughs) of that in this podcast. So I'm excited. (laughs) I thought we could have a little bit of a quick fire getting to know you type questions round, if that's okay. Of course. Cat, what's your yes. favorite cuisine? Oh, any Greek or Mediterranean food. Uh, and what's your yes. go-to comfort food? What would you go to? Um, I would say like a fresh baked cookie with some ice cream on it. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. What kind of cookie? Uh, chocolate chip. Chocolate chip. Classic. Yeah. I like yes. it. Yes. Like. Mm-hmm. Um, your favorite place? You've traveled a lot, so this this would be interesting. Oh, my favorite place. That one's challenging. I, yeah. Um my first the first instinct is Sedona, um, in Arizona. That is just breathtaking to uh like it's in the middle of the desert. You take a right and you go off this side road and then you're driving and all of a sudden there's red rock and it's just wow. like this magical oasis. Uh that's my favorite place for sure. <laughs> Favorite season? Favorite season. I would say spring um, because everything is starting to grow and I love the smell of after a rainstorm, what the grass smells like or if it's like starting to get warm out but it's still kind of chilly and it just rained. Love that. Nice. (laughs) Uh, Star sign. Well, you already said what your star sign is cancer, right? Um, Mm Mm-hmm. I can't remember. Is that July? Is that July? June? July? June. June. Yeah. Okay. June. Oh, so you, you've just had a birthday. Happy birthday. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you spiritual or religious or a mixture or none? I am definitely more spiritual. I have like an omniistic approach. I believe there's truth in all religions. So finding the oneness um, mm-hmm. in all of them, that connection is what my practice Cats or dogs or none or both? Oh, dogs for sure. Although I do, I I was walking outside my house and I heard this loud loud meowing and I turned my head and there was this kitten that ran directly up to me and it was so cute. And I was like, oh, I could probably have a cat one day, Um, but I have two very large dogs. So Uh, (laughs) I don't know how they would like it. Um, I have a English cream golden retriever and a Catahoula Doberman. What was the last movie that you watched? I watched the movie Joy um, with, what is her name? Jennifer Lawrence. Lawrence, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was good. Great movie, great movie. Yeah, it was really good. Um, I had someone on episode three, uh, Sophia Chowdhury. She um, she invented this product and and, and we were talking about it. And the, the film that inspired her was Joy. And so up until... I was up until that podcast, I'd never heard of it. So I went and watched it and I was like, oh my gosh, what a great, great movie. So, um, yeah, cool. Nice. I was like so impressed by her ability to remain so patient and kind mm. with her family in that movie. Mm. <laughs> like, wow, the stamina. 
<laughs> she was channeling her inner Catherine, wasn't she, to try and keep everyone. I don't think everyone. I would be that patient, but that, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> the last book you read, or one that you're currently reading? Oh, I recently read The Alchemist, which had been a long time coming. I heard about it for so long, and I'm like, I want to read that book. And I finally read it, and it is wonderful. Highly recommend. Okay, I haven't read it. Um, oh, yeah. It's great. Highly recommend it. Okay, cool. Could you give mm -hmm. could you give a little tiny a couple of sentences of what it's about? Yeah, so it's a it's a story, which I'm not I usually read like educational books, but it's mm -hmm. about um a young man who's going through the process of individuation and uh achieving self-actualization through a fun journey. Um okay. he I know those are really large words that listeners might be like, what the heck is that? But basically he's going on a journey to really find out what his purpose and mission is in life. Mm -hmm. And through things that he is distracted by, like um, maybe a relationship that he knows is like, this, is, this isn't really for me or it's really steering me off course. He starts to learn these like lessons and everything that he experiences as something that has helped to prepare him for the next level of his life and, right. you know, getting to his end goal of like achieving his mission. So it's a great book. I'm not going to ask if he achieves it, otherwise I'll spoil it. <laughs> um, so a little bit more about your personality. Are you, so those are the quick fire ones down, you know, done. I don't know how quick fire they were, but uh, it's really interesting to, to, to get some of that insight about yourself. Would you say that you lean more towards your logical side or your emotional side? Well, that one's challenging because I use my emotions uh, to be logical. Mm -hmm. So I'll like have um, an emotion come up and be able to sit with it and then determine if something's like for me or not based off of logic of how I have a relationship with my emotions. Like, you know, uh, you have like a an emotion or a feeling in your body of like something mm -hmm. is yes or something is no. Sure. Sure. You so have it's that, usually gut, that either, gut instinct. Yeah. Yeah. And that gut feeling is an emotional response. So it's mm -hmm. like, yes, this makes me happy. No, this makes me sad. And mm -hmm. from that um, polarization or that uh, that specific emotion that you tap into, then you can say, oh, logically, this mm -hmm. seems to be something I'm interested in or no, this is not. And in the past, I know that I probably have overridden my emotional um, information to say, oh, I didn't really want to do that, but I kind of felt pressured. So sure. I was like more maybe logical of saying, oh, I have to appease this person. Um, and instead of listening to my emotions. So again, that's kind of a hard question, but I think using the no, balance of, uh, um, emotions and logic to navigate through life. <laughs> yeah. I was working through this with, uh, an EFT coach, um, and they were talking about the, the, you know, the fight, 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 flight or freeze, you know, coming from, I'm tapping the back of my head, but, you know, coming from that part of your brain and, and, you know, these emotions aren't to be, you know, put to one side and just ignored or suppressed. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get into some of that. Um, but actually, how can we, how can we get to a state of calmness before we make decisions that are going to affect our lives or other people's lives and, and, and start to make, um, you know, decisions based on, on, on the front of our, our brain. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's really good what you're saying. I think there's a lot of truth in being able to recognize what the emotion is, but then also to bring balance to it, to say, well, actually, does this serve me well? Does it serve my mission well, or my vision or the people around me as well? Uh, are you a make things happen person or do you kind of tend to go with the flow? Oh, man, these are like, I want to say I'm like right in the middle of all these. I'm a very go with the flow person. But if I need to add adjustments, it's like I always give the um, people an analogy. Your life is like floating down a river. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when you are in resistance and you're moving upstream is when you're not working with the energy of the universe. So if I need to, if I'm floating down the river, but I get stuck somewhere, I get stuck in a brush. I get stuck in a shallow spot. It's like, oh, okay, I know that I need to take action in order to continue down the river and not be stuck in my spot. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That's cool. It sounds, <laughs> I mean, the key theme to a lot of, you know, what we're talking about here is, is balance, isn't it? 
um, mm-hmm. with you. It sounds like you know you've you've done a fair bit of thought and work in that area. Um, I'm sure there's yes. lots of growth that we can all do, but you know it's it's good to come from that you know um, perspective. Not even yeah, perspective, I'm, probably more mindset. Mindset. Mm. I'm currently in. I'm getting trained um, in an emotional intelligence. It's my next endeavor of my own self progression. I'm mm-hmm. in a year long um, emotional intelligence training. Mm-hmm. Uh, the company is called Grace Line Institute, and their whole mission is about finding the grace line of your life. So that grace mm-hmm. line is the middle point. Um, it's understanding that through the law of like polarity, where everything that you experience, all the questions you've asked me have been polar opposites, right? Like Mm -hmm. emotional or logical or this or that. And so the goal of the training is to actually be able to take both, accept them, but find the middle way. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly what you said. And and when you are practicing that, you're developing emotional intelligence. Mm. That's good. And, and, you know, let you in on a little secret the questions are designed to be like that to see you know where we kind of naturally start from um because let's say uh the logical and emotional side for example Mm -hmm. if you're highly emotional as a person then there are some skills to be learnt um you know some secure attachment styles to work through to get more on a logical side whereas if you're already very very logical then actually it's about trying to find the balance to go the other way um beautiful and if you're and if you're anything like me, you'll bounce from one to the other until you stop, like a, you know what they call the uh, the yo-yo type pendulum. Things, and then you, pendulum, that's it. And then you get yeah. into the middle. But um, yeah, okay, all right. So, uh, what's your favorite thing to kind of do? It doesn't have to be your favorite, but what's what's something that you love to do to just get some downtime? Um, I love to go to the sensory deprivation tanks and do a float. Okay. <laughs> explain what what is going on here it's a it's a huge tank and um it's you close the door and then the lights turn off eventually but it's um all salt water so you okay. like go you meditate in there for an hour and you like float on the top of the water without any sound or being able to see anything so it's like you're you can completely go inward and really have a whole experience of like rest or creative inspiration or just meditation so that's what i like to do <laughs> i i don't know how to respond to that i've never heard it's fun. I've never heard anything like that that's what's yeah. it like, like what's it like how does it feel um it feels it at first when you're first in there it's kind of confusing cuz you're like i don't like you can't you kind of forget where your body's at because you can't see and so you can't see your own body. Um, mm. There's no lights on. So it's it's supposed to mimic the water's kind of like the uh, temperature of your body. Okay. It's supposed to mimic a womb-like state. <laughs> wow. So it, it's a really relaxing experience. And it's it's like very beautifully set up. You, you take a shower and it's like all mood lighting. And then you go in there. And then when you come out, you go into this reintegration room where you sit and there's like a bunch of salt lamps and you can journal and have tea and like just be with yourself a little bit more and as soon as you open the door to go back into the real world it's like so incredibly overstimulating sometimes that it's like Mm -hmm. no wonder why we have so many difficult so much difficulty with connection there's just so much going on and we don't really Mm -hmm. prioritize the the time to like actually turn completely off and mm. be with yourself, recharge your battery so you have enough to give to others in the external world. Yeah, wow. So that's what you do for downtime. Like, that's powerful. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell um, when I need to go do it too, you know? You're just like, mm. man, I haven't prioritized some deep, restorative self-care. Oh. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Uh, do you know about the love languages test? Have you ever done that? Yes, I have. I have thoughts about that, but you have thoughts. for the share same- your thoughts. Share your thoughts. <laughs> I think um, a lot of times the love languages that you are comfortable with 
have to do with just how you were raised to show and receive mm-hmm. love, not necessarily maybe what would be your desired um, love mm-hmm. language if you hadn't had been impacted by those early childhood experiences. And so um, in my own personal ex- exploration with this and working with lots of women, they're like eventually, or they've gone through lots of stuff where they're like, I don't want physical, physical touch. Like, unless it's related to sex and just not something that I want somebody mm-hmm. to be hugging me or touching me. Um, and so with my own realization of being like, Oh, it has a lot to do with feeling very dysregulated in my body or feeling highly stressed mm-hmm. and not wanting that because my just body felt really hypersensitive. And then learning about the nervous system, being able to integrate tools and things like that. Actually, physical touch is my number one now. And I was not mm. shown that as a kid. Um, my parents weren't very touchy with each other. They didn't regularly like go out of their way to hug us or, you know, so it was just something I wasn't familiar with, but it's actually how I love to give love and receive love. Mm. That's really interesting as well to, to, to see it from that perspective again. Um, yeah, being connected to your body really, isn't it? And, and trying to, and trying to work out where is that coming from and, and why are you wired that way? And then to, mm-hmm. to actually be, you know, that being your, um, your love language or your top love language now, um, yeah. takes a lot of self actualization and, and an analysis to get there, which is powerful. Yeah. I also think it could be utilized as a tool to say, which ones do you reject Mm. and kind of work on why you reject them. Like I also say, I don't like to receive gifts. And (laughs) there's like a literal correlation of um, difficulties I've had with receiving abundance. Mm. So if you say, I don't like to receive gifts, you're saying, I don't like to receive. Well, there's a whole therapy session we can have there like well what what makes it hard to receive you know like so there's there's lots of ways that I think that tool can be utilized um just to be curious about how do you create balance of receiving all of those things Mm, yeah really good I'm smiling because this is really resonating (laughs) Um, (laughs) I think that's my top one as well and that's my least and it's actually something I'm trying to work through with a specialist in terms of what does that actually mean not being able to receive gifts or to receive you know what what's going on in in your mindset what are you holding on to what triggers traumas what's going on in the body you know all that kind of stuff um Mm -hmm. which which is why I think the love languages test is fascinating now I'm not saying that we should treat them like a label that you wear and that's it that's you know and and you've you know beautifully made that point as well Um, but they do give you indications of where you're at and you know how to move forward with uh with with gaps in that as well so yeah that's Mm -hmm. really interesting thank you yeah um uh what's a good compliment that you remember that's been said about you um (laughs) just recently like i am very uh goofy i'll just like break out in a dance move if i think that the you know i've the seen environment... your instagram <laughs> <laughs> i can like, testify if i yeah if, if something needs <laughs> some <laughs> some fun and joy i will mm-hmm. be the first one to volunteer to do something that will pick up the mood you know whatever you need you need me to sing karaoke at a bar sweet like i'll do it no. um nice. and somebody who said you know you are medicine and i was like oh <laughs> like Oh, okay. So me wanting just to like be fun and goofy can be seen as providing medicine. So that was mm. a wonderful compliment. It's a great compliment. Yeah. Yeah. Who doesn't want to be around that person, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Unless they, you know, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Stern and serious all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you say people misunderstand about you? Um. I'm on a very different path than many of my family members. Um, And I probably to them seem really crazy. I left my stable hospital job that I worked really hard to get, you know, lots of schooling uh, to start my own practice and do things very differently and basically push the button, push the edge on every area of my life. (laughs) And I think they're like, what are you doing? But I love 
I find pleasure and excitement in living on the edge of my comfortability and being able to push that and expand it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it just maybe makes people misunderstand or uncomfortable because they might not be comfortable with that. So okay. just a projection. And you, you you work through that. You're you're focused on what what you're trying to do. Yeah, I read um, Brene Brown's book about uh, daring greatly, mm-hmm. and she was like, "You can't include people's opinion of what you're doing if they're not in the arena with you." Mm-hmm. you know, that really stuck with me. Like anybody that criticizes what I'm doing, if they're not in the arena, mm-hmm. trying so hard to do things differently or build a new world and provide service to people, then it's not really necessarily important for me to give it much attention or energy. (laughs) Mm, That's good. That's really good. Brene Brown's got a a lot of wisdom behind her, hasn't she? Yes. I've got a lot of time for Brene Brown. Um, uh, Okay. So before we start unpacking intimacy, last question about your Mm -hmm. life and in terms, and this one's to do with routine or rhythm um a kind of maybe a a habit or something like that that you do every day a particular mindset that you put into practice every day um this has been a recent integration that i feel like all the female listeners will okay um will resonate with but really understanding how based on where i'm at in like my cycle um what i feel like i have energy for in the month So Mm -hmm. I am a very creative person. Um, I have to create for my business. But if it's a certain time of the month where I'm not supposed to be pushing, I'm supposed to be more taking care of myself, um, Mm -hmm. really honing in on like, what is my body telling me that I have the capacity to do today? And honoring that limit, honoring when I feel like I have lots and lots of energy to pump out whatever I need to. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's a game changer when you can sync up what you're doing to get done to be productive with that. And it's super important for relationships too, which we can end up talking about. Sure. But just that rhythm that exists in a woman's natural um, part of her life is like Mm -hmm. a game changer when you understand how to use it for, to be more productive or to be, uh, yeah, just more in touch with yourself. Great. Thanks for that. I think, uh, you know, it's an area that I'm probably not an expert in, but it's good to get, you know, some some insight into that. And, and I think it's, it speaks to in, intentionality as well, doesn't it? In terms of, you know, what might be coming, you know, you know, based on experience, what that could be like in terms of energy levels or creativity or emotional responses and even all the physical stuff that comes with that. And, you know, adju- making adjustments so you're not you know, pushing through and giving yourself a a really hard time. It's good. Yeah. And it has so much to do with intimacy and the power that you can unlock with an intimate connection and in a relationship that because even women don't even, they're not even in touch with all that information just yet. It's like not really mainstream to Mm -hmm. sync cycle sync your workouts or your life with your period let alone Mm -hmm. your relationship but really within that knowledge there's so much transformative potential to Mm -hmm. like just take your relationship to the next level (laughs) talking about intimacy and how how important it is but before we do you know if we just if we just go right back to basics you know intimacy 101 what is intimacy? Like, Mm -hmm. what is it? Mm. Yeah, I like to use various uh, analogies, but it's like the embers that keep the fire burning strong. It's feeling seen, heard and understood at a level at which you feel like you are expressing your most authentic self. And I know that's kind of like a word that gets thrown around a lot, but it's this felt experience Mm -hmm. that somebody also sees you feels you hears you in the way that you are in touch with yourself okay all right and 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 so i'm gonna you know obviously i'm gonna try and draw some stuff out of that so yeah is it is it a perceived feeling then is it something that is based on your perception yeah i believe so 
Yeah, I think it's, and this is why it's very important for people to be curious about their internal experience, trying to know themselves, because if you're not doing that and you have, you dissociate, you're not like in your body, you don't have Mm -hmm. a great relationship with the feelings of your body, um, or you're not in tune with what's happening inside, then when someone is trying their hardest to connect with you, but you don't have that connection in yourself, it's like very frustrating because you constantly Mm. feel misunderstood. So intimacy always starts with the intimacy that you cultivate within yourself so that when someone tries to connect with you, you can either say, yes, this is for me. This is not for me based on how it's Mm. I'm receiving it in my body. So one of my questions was going to address that as well. So I think this is the perfect place for it. How how important is it to have that self, uh, that sense of self intimacy? You know, it oh. sounds like what you're saying there is, you know, if you if you're in touch with yourself, then actually you're going to be more in touch with the relational, you know, the people you're relating with around you. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say to someone if they were like, well, intimacy is not really for me. I, you know, I don't have time for it or you know, I don't want to process that way. Um, Yeah. I think intimacy and sexuality often get intermingled. mm -hmm. So if I'm saying intimacy, people automatically assume sex and they're like, Ooh, shame. Just Mm because based on historical principles, like shame around sex, no intimacy is just being able to actually love yourself, be with yourself, be able to tend to your own needs. What are, what are your needs? What are your wants? Mm -hmm. What are your desires? And so if someone is immediately turned off to know I don't want to engage in intimacy, it's like, oh, well, how satisfied are you with your overall life experience? Because intimacy is having a higher quality life experience because you're able to mm. meet your own needs. You're not seeking out an external external validation to meet your needs or your wants. You're in touch with what do I desire in life? Not sexually, mm. but like, do I desire mediterranean food today do i desire going to a sensory deprivation tank today do i desire rest so just being intimate with yourself is to in my opinion really marry this inner child higher self adult version of you together to really become a self-sufficient human Mm. yeah and and it's so important right to to get there i think i've i've worked with um couples um and i can relate to my own life as well when it comes to intimacy you know it's about having that deep connection you know you 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 Mm -hmm. said intimacy sometimes it's just like oh that's the sex life right but actually it's so much deeper it's the emotional intimacy um yes physical intimacy is involved in that as well and the two kind of work hand in hand but it's not it's not one it's not the other um and one of the things that you know comes up quite often um if you'd like to speak to it is people look for that fulfillment in their partner or another person and then Mm -hmm. obviously are very disappointed or you know really upset that it didn't work out and they move on um so so you know finding out within yourself we're we're seeing now as a society is really important isn't it Mm -hmm. yeah i think when you have the mindset that i'm looking for this person to fill my cup or to fulfill something in me that i can't fulfill in myself it's like plugging in to their light source and Mm. so you're relying on them to fill something within you Um, you're dependent on them for that piece but as you know as we all know people are going through their own things in life and so their light source might not always be as potent or strong as when you first plugged in because maybe they're going Mm. through some sort of archetypal or psychic uh, transition or they um, are dealing with a new something in their life where they don't feel like they can show up for you in that way. And if you Mm. are relying on them to always be this constant um, source and they're not showing up because, again, they're going through something, then it causes them to become frustrated and then they're frustrated because it's just like this codependent relationship that ends up breaking or falling or because mm. it wasn't built on a solid foundation of knowing yourself. Mm, really good. Yeah, really. I agree with that as well. I think, and it, and it's so important to build that solid foundation within yourself and then mm-hmm. share, is it, I can't remember what the quote was. 
something along the lines of it's not two half people that make a whole, but it's two whole people that create something special. I'm probably butchered the quote, but uh, you, you get what I'm trying to say there. Yeah, they use like a analogy too. When two half people come together, it's like the um, the relationships built off of an A frame, and as they grow, oh. as they're like growing up like this, the A frame starts to separate and then it collapses. Oh, Whereas wow. like an H frame is two people are both in on their individuation path or like to know themselves and their relationship is the connector point that keeps them connected. So when they move, this piece is just kind of like beautifully in the middle. Of course, mm. that's like the most optimal when, you know, people are growing like like this and like that and like this, you know, but just the the structural piece of that is I like to visualize. Yeah, I really like that. That's a really good, strong image as well. Um, because mm -hmm. you know there is a lot of hey you should just go like this and you'll grow together the closer you get and it's going to be really strong but I've never really thought of it to to to, to go like that that makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you for that that's good you're welcome um, uh, this is part of our relationship series here on this podcast so you know we're looking at intimacy in the lens of relationships um, and so what what part of what part of a relationship does into sorry that's probably not a great question let me rephrase that <laughs> how important okay. is intimacy uh, in a relationship um well i think it's it is like the embers that really keep the spark alive um in the quantum physics realm <laughs> um we are energy and mm -hmm. we emit an electromagnetic field that is about six feet, depending on your emotional state, outside of your physical body. And for everyone who's like, what, that is false, you can look up um, Heart Math Institute. They're actually doing um, scientific studies. I always like to look for any sort of relevant science that is available to support sure. these crazy claims I'm making. Um, <laughs> they are measuring that we do have this bubble around mm. us so I have a bubble and you have a bubble and in the middle where they intersect. So you can think about a Venn diagram where like mm -hmm. two bubbles are intersecting. This middle piece is a third thing that's created from the union of two people. And mm. that middle piece is intimacy. So mm. depending on how much effort you're putting into that dynamic, that will shrink it will get bigger and that is the creation of what actually makes up your relationship so without mm -hmm. intimacy um i think that that space is like just exists um in two people who are maybe roommates or cohabitating but there's no actual connection happening um would you say that explains why sometimes you might have to people who uh, have tried to start a relationship and for some reason it doesn't work the vibe's not there there's no spark well maybe there's a spark but there's no chem you know the word chemistry gets thrown around and um, do you think that talks speaks to that um as well in terms of like maybe that what vibe. you're bringing both to the vibe yeah yeah that energy is that i mean yeah attraction is like usually related to polarity um and how much potential there is for the person to cause a chemical change within our being. So that's at like a, a, a chemical level that that's happening. But polarity is usually what causes attraction um, and desire to occur. So maybe dropping into someone's bubble, they're like, ooh, this one feels uh, too close to like my resting state. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's no room for me to actually grow because they're not pulling me into a direction. We're always seeking growth. Um, mm. and if you're not seeking growth then you're stagnant and not moving in a positive direction, but sure. I think inherently we're all, all seeking being alive. And so I think dropping into someone's bubble and, and kind of at a subconscious level, seeing if this person will have the capacity to make us grow is mm. what that is. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's part, there's, there's evolution, uh, within that as well, I guess, you know, yeah. Um, Okay. And then in terms of like, you you know, you talked about polarity there, um, you know, that, you know, people often say mainstream opposites attract, is that speak, do you, would you say that speaks to that polarity? Yeah, I think, um, 
I think I, I think also think mainstream is focusing a lot on polarity uh, uh, in terms of pushing men to be more masculine and fe- females to be more feminine for the polarity to exist. But I think mm. um, depending on like <laughs> at a spiritual level, what it is you need to learn next is often the person that kind of shows up for you. Okay. Um, so if there's something that you need to learn from someone that you're dating, it might have the polarity of, oh, that's a lesson I need to learn. I'm attracted mm. to this person. I learn whatever I need to from there. So yeah, there's a polarity aspect because you're trying to be that alchemist of I am here, but I need this thing in order to grow. So I'm going to move there. So yeah, there is a polarity component to it. Okay. Thank you. Um, You brought up masculine and feminine there. Um, In terms of, uh, you know, your work and the people that you've worked with, um, you know, do you see patterns in in men and patterns in women that are quite, I I don't want to be overly stereotypical or generalized because I think everyone's different and we're all made up differently and we're all unique and all the rest of it. But do you see patterns that, that, that let's let's take one one of one of them and then move on to the other. let's say with men do you see you know men struggling with very similar sorts of things when it comes to intimacy within themselves and intimacy in relationships yeah um as a generalization it seems like men because they are um ex- exp- um suppressing their emotional state or they're uh they get in trouble when they behave in a way that's like in their nature to behave showing Mm -hmm. anger or aggression like an animal would in order to expel or express your emotions um because they're often disciplined for that Mm -hmm. i think that they've kind of swung from like masculine to more of the feminine wounded energy Mm -hmm. so they're in their wounded feminine of not being able to express themselves. Um, And then females are often like the victim of various things, right? They're suppressed in their ability to move up in the world or um, to have leadership positions. And so they kind of like have taken on the opposite in terms of the wounded masculine. So it seems like we've, not only like come into the opposite paradigm, but we're in the shadow of those expressions. Mm. So in my own experience, this is trying to just like relate it to me and not be like, oh, overgeneralization. Mm. I was hyper masculine um, in a wounded way because I've had a lot of wounding around interactions with men. So I've taken on a more hyper independent um, Mm. personality and in my acknowledgement of that like I'm like oh my gosh I am just expressed in the shadow side of my masculine I was able to then alchemize that um, in my own experience uh, by taking actionable steps like doing um, I've done Krav Maga like Uh, learning how to defend myself so that I could build up and actually like a positive attribute of the masculine for that to change from staying down in that suppression and that hyper independence and the isolation and the anger and Mm. turn it into a positive aspect. So now that I feel safe in my body, I know Mm. where my boundaries are at. I know how to verbalize a no, what's a no in my body. Now I can reside more into my um, my feminine or, you know, come to the other side, work on the shadow feminine. So it's mm. like a puzzle pieces. But sure. I, I think um, to go back to your original question, I think we've moved from the masculine and the feminine polarity. We've crossed over and now we're kind of sitting in the shadow a little bit. Mm. Um, so in order to really allow people to express their natural polarity, we have to acknowledge their pain and sure. acknowledge their hurt and let that be expressed in order to um, go back to harmony and balance in each individual. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. And 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 just to dig down a little bit, you know, um, 
just to help anyone who's listening to to sort of relate you know when when you if i can take that you know your situation yeah, from course. from female from feminine to go to the masculine and then live in the shadow and and that independence you know is that what does that look like day to day is that putting up walls is that kind of not allowing anyone to help you and trying to do things on your own um would you say those are the kinds of things um that are in the shadow of that yeah for sure uh not being able to receive <laughs> um not feeling safe uh walking by myself so noticing that i'm kind of like walking in a braced posture being an emotionally mm -hmm. reactive more than i'd like to be you know if like someone pushes a button i'm like more emotionally reactive more sensitive um yeah just not in touch with my yes and no's um mm -hmm. so it was just kind of like a dissociated another way that you can look at it as like a dysregulation in my nervous system. Um, I was dissociated or I was just like turned off to connection and um, yeah, hyper independence, very much goal oriented and driven to accomplish things versus like yeah. getting in touch with the flow of my monthly experience. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I just, I definitely took on more of that. Um, isolated role in my shadow I, re I really also like you know that you went from the shadow of the masculine expression and actually you know took on was it a martial art did you say um, mm -hmm. and so you're not this damsel in distress looking for this big guy to come up and make you feel safe you, you've actually owned that yourself and said well i need to feel safe within who i am not look for that externally and you know one yeah. of the things that we're taught as men is um to get a woman to open up and be you know her her natural self um she needs to be in an environment where she feels safe um mm -hmm. so you know being able to have that safety within you i think you know allows you to move back into the, your feminine expression um yeah which i think is really powerful you know and it, but it takes work right it's not something you just you know switch on like a light yeah i think um i have recently focused my practice to work with specifically men. Um, I always am encouraging of their partners to come along on the journey. And of course, I'll work with them if they're interested. But this concept that's placed on men that they need to provide women with safety, like they're responsible for the safety is not necessarily fair because mm -hmm. women have to know what it feels like to be safe in their own body. Um, if they don't know what that feels like, then they'll constantly nitpick or not feel safe in the presence of a man. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's just as much uh, the females as it is the males to collaborate in that effort. Um, I mean, in the external world, I would hope that the masculine would be the protect the protector. But um, in my experience, that un in that unfortunately was not the case. So. I didn't know which males that I could trust in order to provide protection, um, which was like any man that would step into my field. It, like it was really hard for me to even be like, I don't, this is what I need you to do in order for me to feel safe. So I had to go on my own journey of finding out what it means to feel safe um, in mm. order to better communicate that to the man. Because otherwise they're just like, you know, trying to, I don't know, shoot, shooting for fish in the dark or something. I don't know what the expression yeah, yeah, is, yeah. but they're like, what? The, I don't even know what to do. And yes. then you're not in your feminine and then they're not able to uh, step into their masculine. So there's lots of dynamics that get messed up there. Mm -hmm. Really powerful, I think. And, and, and on point as well, I think, you know, as a male, sometimes it's, well, I've tried to make you feel safe. I've, I've done, and, you know, you list all the things. I did this, I did this, I did this. Um, and it reminds me of, um, you know, we talked, we did a quick fire round about things that you like. If you go into a restaurant, if you don't know what you like, um, you shoot, like you said, you're shooting in the dark. You, you, you don't even know what you like. So how can then you, how can you expect the person who's with you to, you know, to fill that need, let's say. Um, mm -hmm. So I think with emotions as well and, and safety and all, you know, all the things that we carry around and we want from our partner, um, we need to know ourselves, what is it that we want or, or at least be in the, in the, in the realm of what we want so that when they show up, we can 
measurably go oh yeah they showed up for me actually they they're doing the best that they can or um i feel safe or i choose to feel safe because i can see the effort that the other person's putting in uh, based mm -hmm. on my likes desires wants needs etc um, yeah i also i also want to add this um perspective too because i think it's important for both sides to hear it um mm -hmm. i recently i read something about um like a wolf pack and the leader, let's say it's a masculine man, he is the leader of the wolf pack. He's in charge of keeping the say, the pack safe in the external environment. Um, but and he can't relax. He can't like take a break unless he knows that there's another equal wolf, mm -hmm. which in studying like wolf packs is an alpha male and alpha female. Right. So unless unless the alpha or he needs an alpha female to take over so that he can go rest. Otherwise, mm. it will be like a wolf that doesn't last very long because he's constantly wow. in a state of activation. And this wow. is what I feel from a lot of men is they're like on all the time. They're going to work yes. and they come home and then they're expected to create a safe space around emotions or they're completely disconnected and docile because they're like, I don't know mm. what to do, so I'm dissociated, I give up. Mm. And women are the, in my opinion, they're the leaders of the mental emotional space. Mm -hmm. So their job is to be inquisitive about going internally, being able mm. to become emotionally intelligent, to be able to self-regulate so that they can help hold the space not that they need to hold it all the time, but hold the space for the home environment. Um, so yes. when the man comes home, it's not like I'm relying on you to make me feel safe. I understand what's happening. This is what I need from you. Mm -hmm. And in developing her own ability to lead in that space, she opens up the container for him to relax into his mm -hmm. mental, emotional expression so mm -hmm. she can hold that space just as she expects him to hold that space for her externally. You know, like yeah. keep me safe in the outside world, provide. And um, I think that dynamic is pretty beautiful to think about. Like they're mm. the masters, the leaders of the external and she's the, they're the, you know, women are the masters leaders of the internal. And, and within mm. that dynamic, you create this beautiful container for a therapeutic process, a transformative process to occur within relationships. Mm. Oh, I love that. No, it's really good. I think as well, you know, if the, you know, taking that, um, if the woman is the the leader, the master of that of that expression of the emotions, actually, you know, I'm speaking as a man, um, having a partner that can hold my emotion as well and actually explore my emotion and help me to see what it is I'm actually feeling, um, then becomes really powerful for me because then I can rest in that um, mm -hmm. as well, which which I think is really good, really powerful. Um, yeah. And, you, you know, you see this stereotypical, you know, man comes home. I know things change. I know we live in a very, um, we live in a modern world, let's say. Um, but, you know, uh, a man coming home um, and always being switched on, let's say. And then you, you, you hear from men, I just want to switch off. I just want to watch the sports, play computer games, whatever it is, go golfing, whatever. It's, it's this, I am on all the time and I just need to switch off and I'm, i've never really seen it like that the, beautifully put in terms of the wolf pack and going well actually the other wolf who is fully capable fully powerful can can watch god let's say while i have a little bit of downtime refresh renew and and, and wake up and start again the next day what kind of things do you get back from men what kind of things do they say to you hey you, you've really helped me see xyz um I basically am just allowing them to learn the language of how to relate to women through the healing process of their own journey. So because they're not often encouraged to explore this, I'm doing it in a way that's like, this is going to help you to be able to communicate better with her just by developing the safe container of exploring their emotional expression. Mm -hmm. Um 
what have they said about working together? I mean, there's a lot, I have lots of testimonials on my website from men that are very descriptive in the way that they tell me about being able to be intimate with their wife again, or sure. they're like, oh, I used one of your prompts that you have on your social media and I just said it at dinner and I just watched her eyes light up towards me. So it's just like these little micro mm -hmm. ripple effects that happen when they're just like, oh, tell me what to do. I want to serve my woman. I just don't have like a clear roadmap of mm -hmm. being able to find mutual connection and understanding. And that's really why I decided to do this because there's lots of men working with men and women working with women, but there's not a lot of overlap in saying, I'm a woman. I want to help you understand women and help mm. you understand yourself. So I'm going to be a friend to men. And I actually mm. just partnered with my sister who helps with men's wardrobe consult. She's a men's wardrobe consultant. So as I'm helping men to experience this internal transformation, she helps them to say, now that you're this new person, let's create a new external persona that you feel confident expressing. It reminds me of uh, it's a few years ago now, we, we, we ran an event where, uh, and it was a men's event. Um, mm. And we'd already, you know, had some guest speakers talk to men about how to relate with, to women, how to serve your wife better, how to start relationships, things like that. And then we did this one um, and it was called What Women Want. And so what I did was I got a panel of seven women from a single person who was quite young all the way through to, you know, newly married, um, have, had a child, divorced, um, widowed, you know, all that kind of stuff. And they were given pretty much the same questions. And we filled like so many people turned up for that because they wanted mm. to hear from a woman what women want. Um, so I think there's a lot of power in having that that cross, you know, that cross education um, because now you're, you're listening um, to the other side, let's say, um, in a way that, you know, maybe we can't do uh, without that input. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's really good that you're doing that and you've seen that there is, you know, a gap in that area. Um, and it sounds like you're getting loads of testimonials, which is phenomenal. We'll, get, we'll, we'll, put, your, um, we'll put your website uh, down at the bottom here so people cool. can have a look at that as well. Um, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I have uh, three sisters and one, one brother. And my two sisters are married and my brother's married. And so um, sitting back and being the observer of not only our core family's dynamics, but now that they've integrated other people into the dynamics and seeing from such a level of like, oh my gosh, I know my sisters and I know what they need. And I know my sister-in-law. I also know my brother, right? And like, right. so being a friend to both sides and just saying like, oh, if you had this little thing right here, if you said this, she would be, she, her body would open to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like helping people to really learn the language of the nervous system and be very attuned to the body positioning or tone of voice and how that is either telling you that this person is open or closed to you. They're open and they feel safe to explore mm -hmm. or they feel closed off. And when they feel closed off, it's not that they're closed off to you. It's closed. They're 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 protecting a wound. Mm, yeah. So if they're protecting a wound and they're turned off to you, how can you respond in a loving way that allows them to not only open to you, but work through something that they might not even know is there, keeping them mm. from connecting. Mm. So again, you're creating this really beautiful process of healing and therapy by you just understanding those principles. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if I think about the uh, anxious attachment style, speaking from a male perspective of, oh, she's closed off. I must do because very solution focused i must do, 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 do in order to to get it to open up and when when that kind of level of, when it's coming from an energy or a perspective of fear oh my gosh you know uh, i need to i need to step into this more it tends to have the opposite effect of what the intention is and that is to make the other you know make um, the woman feel safer but actually mm -hmm. coming from that anxious perspective you 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 you're creating more anxiety and more distance, um, which, which, which is sorry, you're gonna. It's just no, it's really good. tricky, <laughs> really tricky. No, 
And and that, um, if you go back to the bubble that we talked about, you have this mm-hmm. bubble. I am a bubble and you're a bubble. And if people, that's the, that's the language of your nervous system. So if I'm anxious, that means I am emitting into my bubble anxiety. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> my yeah. bubble feels tense. It feels chaotic. Yes. It feels disharm- disharmonious. I don't know if that's a word, but it's going to be now. We'll it doesn't make it feel like we'll make it, <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's in harmony. It feels yeah. d- in distress. So remember those two bubbles intersect. And if this mm. person is feeling like I'm protecting myself because I'm scared and you, your bubble to them feels chaotic, not safe. Mm. That's why she stays closed. So I don't even like attachment theory. I realize it's important to be able to identify with a feeling that you're having, but I will always be a more proponent for you have something that causes a trigger to your nervous system that mm-hmm. then causes anxiety. So you're not always anxious. Sure. And when a lot of people kind of like hold on to that label, they're like, oh, I'm like this because I have an anxious attachment. It's like, mm. no, that's just a marker of something that you are associating being an uh, associated with anxiety. So mm. again, being curious about that wound, what you're protecting in the anxiety. And so the the deep, deep, deep healing work is acknowledging really at the most basic level, you have mm. a bubble that you're responsible for. Mm. Your bubble is everything that you emit into the world and the more self-awareness that you have, the more awareness you can have around your bubble and its influence on the people that you love and vice versa. Yeah. I love that you use the word responsibility as well because because then if we own that, if we say, well, actually, that's what I'm transmitting, that's what I'm bringing into this relationship and therefore it's something that I can work on. I don't have to you know, project that onto anybody else. I, I can, you know, do the work or, mm-hmm. you know, go in that direction. Yeah. 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 And I think with labels as well, that, you know, love languages, attachment styles, strength finders, you know, there's Myers-Briggs, all of this kind of stuff. Um, I think they're great indicators. They're just good indicators. And I think, you know, from my opinion anyway, is that we don't live under this label and say, well, that's it. That's me now. I'm, I'm, anxiously attached or I'm an avoidantly attached because Mm -hmm. in different relationships you might not have that attachment style to that person because again the bubble the energy the 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 Venn diagram um you know is a different is a different um entity that you've created by having that overlap Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, and that's another good um example is when people get like an MRI of injury Lots of times they want to attack like a, a herniated disc or arthritis in their knee. They're like, no, I got this MRI four years ago and it mm-hmm. told me that there was this bulge in my back. And actually, if you do MRIs over time, you can see that healing takes place and things change mm-hmm. based on what you said, like a new circumstance allows the bubble dynamic to be different. But people are so attached to wanting to categorize and put themselves into this, oh, I know exactly what's wrong with me. I'm going to attach myself to a label because then it justifies my behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you that keeps you in victim mindset, though, and doesn't really allow for much growth and transformation. So if just even that, like you're constantly changing. Mm -hmm. And the more you're actually allowing yourself with curiosity to change is like, how you're going to experience the most growth the quickest. Mm. Um, And so things are always changing. It's just when we attach ourselves to one outcome or one explanation is when we really get stuck. Yeah, and I I like that because, again, you use the word responsibility, but and now you've said justification. And and when you have justification for, you know, how you're reacting, you you tend to lose responsibilities or, or at least you, you know, you don't take ownership of your part in that. Um, and I think that's really important because if we all take responsibility for our part, it might not mean that we can fully understand it, but we do the work to go, well, actually, this is in my yard. So therefore, I should look into this and get some professional help or or at least start reading around it to get some perspective. Yeah. I love that. This is in my yard. Mm-hmm. It's good. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a guy called Henry Townsend, I think. He talks a lot about boundaries. He's written some books around boundaries. 
Um, I'm probably doing him a disservice. He's, uh, he's he's very highly respected, but uh, but the analogy of you know your backyard and boundaries are the fences that you put up in order to protect your backyard. Um, mm-hmm. I found that really interesting um, because often we can either put up really high walls uh, and you know, you know stay in that independence fortress like state, or we could go in the other direction and just not have any boundaries and and sort of bleed on each other and get bled on and then not try and work out what's going on you know um so yeah what's in your yard you know you posted something recently about contradictory messages that men are getting what mixed messages are we sending to men um i mean geez there's like you need to be more masculine um expressing emotions is weak Mm -hmm. uh your woman wants this your woman wants that um you should be this way it's all about like making these definitive claims of how men should be and to be Mm. fair to acknowledge how how impacted women are in this way i mean this is something that we've dealt with a lot uh with beauty standards and with different like oh you can't work and be a mom and be a wife and so there's there's Everyone wants to take their own experience and create truth around it and try to mm-hmm. throw it onto others as a general generalization and truth for the entire population or gender. And I think that's mm-hmm. so silly and we're always like per, we're always in a state of projection and mm-hmm. I just I anything that comes across that says this is the truth, this is how things should be. I always am kind of like pushing the envelope there because not truth is subjective and it's always tr- changing. Mm-hmm. It's like it's always changing. So I'm a huge proponent of just helping somebody to find their truth and stick with what feels good for them instead of being how they think they should be or what they should be doing to please their woman, kind of like keeping a container around the sink, the sacredness of mm-hmm. your own individual expression and the sacredness around the creative container that you have um, in mm-hmm. within the relationship. See, I, I would push back a little bit and I, I would say that my belief is that there is absolute truth, um, mm. but I don't think that human beings necessarily can digest what is the absolute truth if that makes sense so we all have our perspectives Mm. on it we all have our projections we all have our triggers and we see things and we receive things in in different ways but i think there is an absolute truth um and you know whether you believe in god or the universe or you know sacred energy or whatever i feel like that is the you know that source or wherever that comes from is the is the is the absolute truth if that makes sense yeah but i also think that absolute truth is felt within each person it's like mm-hmm. really really hard to get everybody on board with the same absolute truth just because mm. we all have our own distortions of reality based off of past experiences so mm. i mean i think it would take a lot of psychedelics to get everyone like defibril- <laughs> defibrillated into the sure. same frequency of truth <laughs> pour it into the tap water and everyone everyone has it at once you know <laughs> yeah g- maybe <laughs> that's a scary don't do thought. it and say that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't do it and blame it on me this guy <sighs> Rick, he, he made me do it no no i'm kidding um all right thank you for that thank you for that i think there is there is a lot of messages that we're sending to men and um you know there's a lot of conservative voices now out there uh, and please, you know, you know, if anyone's listening and, and to you, I'd say the same thing. You know, I don't necessarily think con- conservative thinking is a bad thing, um, nor do I think that liberal thinking is a bad thing. I think there's value in in both sides of, you know, the expression of, and I, and I think there's a balance between logic and emotional, you know, ties into what we've talked about before. But there mm-hmm. are some conservative voices now that seem to be, you know, really making it out there in the world. Um, which probably have really good messages in them, but then there's the distortion of, you know, underlined bigotry or misogyny or other stuff that kind of creeps in, which I think, you know, goes back to what I think about absolute truth. I think we just, 
we just project or we just try to align absolute truth with what we think is our truth so that we, we make ourselves feel better. But you used yeah. the word curiosity earlier on. And I think when you go from a place of curiosity and wanting to learn, I think that's when you develop and grow. Um, but yeah, uh, what are your thoughts around, you know, some of the, I don't really want to like say any particular names, but, um, you know, there are some, some, some big names out there that are, are speaking messages to men um, that are really resonating with men. Um, I think each person's job here is to push edges. Mm -hmm. um, so they go out and they have their own expression of what they believe to be true. And for the sake of gathering data that mm -hmm. people can absorb and hopefully uh, with what is coming in terms of like emotional intelligence, nervous system regulation, these hot topics that are starting to kind of bubble up, you can take that information and digest it and actually make an adult decision about what's true for you versus what somebody told you is true. Mm. I think we're really far away from that being um, <laughs> a thing that's normal for people to take in information and say, just like you said, I would push back on that a little bit because your own belief was not congruent with mine. So being able to take mm -hmm. in what I'm saying and not say, oh, well, you know, I have a lot of trust in what Kat says and I'm mm. going to take that as my truth. You said, no, I heard her. I don't mm. think she's bad or wrong for having her opinion, but my truth says something a little bit different. Um, mm. So, I mean, unless the planet, like their the frequency uh, raises so much that everyone kind of gets to the adult mindset and is able to have conversations like this. There, they'll always be like, "Oh, uh, shiny object. They told me this thing. I'm going to take it as truth, and then I'm going to put mm. it in my little box of safety, and that's how I'm going mm. to interact with the world. And anyone that says differently is wrong and bad and evil." Yeah, yeah. And I think you know, speaking to that, uh, the culture here in the UK, at least, is you could sit around in a pub, have a pint and completely disagree with each other, have mm. the most robust conversation, you know, support different football teams or different political ideologies or whatever. And then at the end of it, you'd shake hands and you'd move on and that'd be that. Whereas, I mean, at least as an onlooker onto maybe the states and, and some of the, the dynamics there, it seems to be people are really going more into either the left or the right side of the polit political sp sphere and mm -hmm. and you know staying there whereas you know I, I love what you said there you can you can have your own view and still be civil and respect the other person and actually learn something you know from the other side i think it's important i think the united states is the youngest country and we are in our teenage angst years <laughs> and we want to fight everybody and we want to fight each other and we are just angry and have a lot of suppressed emotions that have not yet been expressed. So it turns out like, oh, someone disrespected me. Someone disagreed with me. I'm going to take everything that has been bothering me in the last month, week, years, and I'm going to project mm. it on this situation and blow it up instead of being able to like say, <laughs> oh, this has nothing to do with this and have a more adult mm. mindset. So yeah, I think it's just that the United States is very immature in their emotional uh, ability to process emotions and have civilized conversations. <laughs> Sorry, America, don't cancel us. <laughs> <laughs> you cancel me. I mean, <laughs> isn't it funny though? What you'd say to a teenager, and being very generalistic, is it's going to be okay. It's all right. You'll get through this. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's our message to America tonight. But um, yeah, <sighs> yeah. Um, I want to talk, this is part of the relationship series, as I said, so I want to get into uh, a topic that, you know, I think uh, some of my male listeners would uh, sort of not be too happy if I didn't bring it up. And so that is around sexual intimacy. And, and you know, we can totally talk about how the two work together in terms of emotional intimacy and sexual intimacy. Um, and so, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that comes up a lot is, you know, I'm in a long term relationship, maybe they're married. And for some reason, that that balance is now shifted and so you know you have uh, men i'm being very generalistic here because it's not you know every case but um men who seem to have a higher libido and want to want that kind of you know physical intimacy more so than their their partners uh, what would you say to that how would you what would you say to men who are really struggling in that area um i think that there's uh a lot 
of fog in between your connection that um, doesn't allow for the woman to, first of all, see that that's an issue and second of all, care. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. I think I was just thinking about this the other day. Women, I don't think that there's a a difference in libido necessarily. I think over time, women tend to become like mother figures in the relationship. They like take care of their spouse or they maybe haven't had their needs, their mental, emotional needs met. And because they don't feel safe to express the way that they're feeling, all these like roadblocks keep getting put up. Meanwhile, she's like starting to even dissociate from her own experience and like becomes Mm -hmm. numb to her own body. So I do a lot of education on just the nervous system states, especially like moms, uh, women who are moms and have the responsibility of really caretaking, caregiving um, for their kids, making sure the home environment is okay and like feeling like they have a lot on their plate and not having time to rest and turn off. They actually turn off by dissociating and by being overwhelmed and by being chronically tired or starting to manifest physical illnesses because of Mm -hmm. the state of their nervous system. And um, the way that your nervous system works is like, great, you have periods of time during the day where you take action to go make coffee or go get dressed. These are things, normal activations of your system. But when you are in a fight or flight state or uh, a higher level is a state of overwhelm, it mm. creates this ladder, this ladder of connection. So on the bottom, you are connected. In the middle, you're either fighting or flighting. You're running away or you're mm. fighting in some capacity. Or you're so overwhelmed with what's happening that you completely turn off to your experience. You, mm. um, like I said, dissociate. Maybe you are um, distracting yourself with various modalities to distract yourself. And the key here is that if you want to make it back down to connection sexually um, or just in general, like intimacy, you have to climb back down the ladder, which means you have to process through your emotional experiences, Mm -hmm. clear the resentment that you might be harboring Mm -hmm. for your partner that they have no idea that you're like (laughs) holding this little box of like, he did this and he did this and he did this and he never Mm -hmm. said, I'm sorry and blah, 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 blah. The more things you have in your box, the further you get away from wanting and desiring your partner. Mm. So that process of like coming back down the ladder is what therapies or coaching is very helpful towards because it's right. helping people to navigate that de- as- de-escalation of that experience in a way that is healthy um, mm-hmm. and, and working on communication, working on boundaries. But I would say the biggest thing that happens in relationships is that females are not expressing um, their wants, needs, and desires because of maybe they were told that women don't, women's voices don't matter or mm-hmm. women are better not uh, heard. Um, mm-hmm. So those subconscious programs or just not even knowing what's happening in your body not being able mm. to express that to your partner just creates more and more and more and more distance. Mm. Yeah, that's really helpful. And, 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 you know, when we're talking about taboos and, and, and things that women are supposed to do, I mean, even like if we look at society, you know, if a, if a male has uh, a particular body count or if he's overly sexual, that's celebrated. Whereas if a woman is in touch with her sexuality, you know, she's judged not only by men, but also by women as well. Um, and it's, mm-hmm. you know, there's, I'm starting to see some, you know, some highlighting of that. It's not, it's not everywhere, but yeah, there's, there's uh, some, I can't remember her name now. I think, I think she runs something called the respected man. And she's mm-hmm. a woman who talks to other women about how to sort of feed that side of a man's, you know, emotional state in terms of respect and, and how, mm. you know, men crave that. Um, and she taps into, you know, being in touch with yourself and your own sexuality so that you can, you know, shake off these taboos and shake off that this is bad or you should feel guilty and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. That was my exploration through the shadow of masculine. It's like, oh, mm. I realized how often I allowed people to cross my boundaries in many domains when, Mm. you know, I, I did not want, 
that exchange. And Mm -hmm. in acknowledging that and putting those barriers into place, those boundaries in place, able to relate better to men and be more in touch with my femininity, with my sexuality, with my sensuality, all Mm. those aspects of like being in my body at that point. Mm. Yeah. And it's so important, isn't it, to get those two aligned because, you know, you hear like lust and and sex is just sex. Um, But actually, you know, um, what we find is when the two align together, it's a beautiful connection that's more than just physical. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, You know, there's a spiritual element to it when your emotions, your soul is intermingling with someone else's emotions and soul and that's happening through a physical experience, you know, which um, which is a powerful force, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. I, w- I, we might have to do an episode two because I just went to <laughs> Egypt and right. I was teaching about the sacred principles of like sacred sex and relationships and how they viewed relationships back in ancient times okay. and their um, beliefs around the capacity and the potential for a relationship is like otherworldly. They would see mm-hmm. this interwoven dynamic of intimacy and sex practices to be able to transcend the physical body and the 3d. And they were doing, they were using sex as a way to manifest or, Uh, to create things in the external environment. And like, I don't know if you've ever been to Egypt, but it was mind blowing the technology that was available at a time where sex was seen as a reverent, sacred, powerful act and how Mm. our even architecture looks in a society where sex is very suppressed and talked uh, poorly about and not celebrated. Let's do that as an episode too. That's really (laughs) I mean, you've got you got me really interested in that. Yeah, really that good. it was very mind blowing uh, experience. So, wow. I mean, I can yeah, I can draw parallels with other sort of yeah. Let's let's save that one for episode two. I like I like that. There's another yeah. episode to this. This is good. <laughs> um, I wanted to I wanted to connect. You know, so so on this on this on this journey or, or, or this thread about sex, right? So you've got you know men maybe wanting or desiring that. Um, and then being very uh, solution focused. So if I do X, Y, Z, then I'll get my need met, which is sexual um, and being very, you know, black and white about it. And then uh, on the other side, you know, a woman opening up when she does feel safe and she does feel her emotions are being heard and she feels like she's, um, you know, valued, you know, um, by the male. In those, in those, you know, t- I want to, I want to try and get away from if a woman does this, then it's great for the man. If the man does this, it's great for the woman. We, you know, we can kind of see that, and we don't really want it to be a transactional thing. Although, it, you know, there's there's elements of transaction. I, I build that context up just to ask you this question, and that is, how can one or the other take steps of courage to get over the fear that's associated with all that? Does that start with nervous? system regulation does it start with mindset you know what would you speak into that yeah i think um it definitely has a lot to do with nervous system regulation it's being able to um understand the language of the nervous system and i like to use the analogy that like getting into the primal our primal connections to just relating to others is being embodied in Mm. our ability to just like be very firm in yourself so that when you are going in courage you're never putting the end result on their ability to say yes or no um Mm. you feel confident in the way that you're even approaching them because if you have any inkling that they're going to reject you or that your happiness depends on their response then you like reiterate this feedback loop that Mm. continues to affect you subconsciously as you interact with this person. So maybe they said no, and then you remember that the next time because you know you're feeling rejected. So it's always going back to like, how is my body feeling? How can I process through this rejection? Knowing that it often has nothing to do with you. It's like Mm. they're probably going through something or they're tired 
And it's not up to you to be able to interpret that because your partner should have responsibility too in the process. But Mm -hmm. if you can hold like, what is, what is my safety piece confidence feel like in my body constantly? How can I meet those needs in myself? Then you're not putting the um, expectation for gratification on the other person always Mm -hmm. and, and further embedding that, uh, that feedback loop um, with that interaction. But that's easier said than done, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I think is you know to be fair to men in this as well. Um, you know, if if a woman needs a man to, you know, be in a space where he can open up and be vulnerable with his emotions and create that connection, that deep connection between the two, and he finds that very difficult. Um, and then the other way around, if a woman, if a man requires the woman to um, you know, open up sexually so that he can feel that deep connection. Um, it's it, it, there's some give and take there, isn't there? There's this, there's this, there's this dance. Can I say of I serve you, you serve me, and then within that we serve each other, and therefore that that Venn diagram little circle starts to get bigger and bigger, and um, you know we're building an entity that it's you know beyond uh, us as individuals. The, the term serving each other is huge in, mm. in developing the sacredness or, and the, the capacity, the potential for transcendent experiences is like serving each other. Um, mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm. It's funny, isn't it? Like uh, the things that the, the more self-centered you become, the less happy or peaceful or joyful uh, experiences that you you experience whereas the more selfless or sacrificial you become not not to your i mean there's there's a there's a boundary right you you don't want to yeah. completely you know empty out yourself and be completely burnt out and and resentful and all the rest of it but there is this sense of serving you know community but i guess we're talking about relationships here um the other person that actually i, th- I can't remember I, i'm terrible at remembering quotes right but um Me if too. i can paraphrase it you too okay high five um, <laughs> um the idea of um you experience love when you give love mm. more so than you do when you receive it um and if you receive it whilst you're giving it then that's the ultimate firework isn't it that's that's the, the that's the win-win you know um, yeah mm-hmm. yeah the yeah. law of receptivity Giving and receiving and balance. Mm. Yep. It's all about that middle way. Here we go. Back to the. I know. It's just, it's all about that balance, isn't it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have so many other questions, but I know we're getting on. So um, is there anything that jumps out to you that you'd love to speak into? Um, mm. I think we, I think we brought it back to our original discussion of the potential of relationships and how you can start yeah, to yeah. manifest things with the with the mm. creation of your love, <laughs> yeah, but that will be episode two. Episode. Well, one of the things uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll, I'll throw this in the mix and then and then we'll wrap up. You know, when we're talking about relationships, it's it's I'm I'm very romantic in nature, and and what I mean by that, yes, romantic in terms of relationships, but actually have a romantic way of looking at life, and that is you know to look at the ideal to go in courage, to, to, to battle anxiety or fear or panic attacks or some of, you know, some of these things, de- depression and stuff that really, you know, are a big weight on you to, to go mm-hmm. forth and take a step in that direction. Um, because there's this, there's this ideal, there's this, there's this virtue, there's this courage that can, that can pull you through and take you to a better life. And I think for me, you know, on a personal level, I think that brings much meaning and that brings a sense of direction. Um, so I say all that. Um, so when I'm looking at relationships, you know, there is this conversation around you meet someone, they're your soulmate, maybe they're the person you've chosen to do life with, and then you go off and it's happily ever after. And, you know, the, the credits come up and everyone claps and, and they walk off. But when, but in reality, <laughs> we don't see always that that is the case. So, so with that in mind, you know, you said something about going on a journey and sometimes, you know, you're looking and the universe brings someone along that you know aligns with what you need for that season um so in relationships Mm. when would you say in your experience working with with people when's a good time to say look you know it's time to move on you know um what kind of flags or what kind of things do you think 
um, come up that say, well, actually, you know, in order to, to, you know, be who I am and be who you are, it's, it's, it's time to go our separate ways. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you initially have a thought that comes up of awareness of like, something doesn't feel right here. And that's not necessarily the time to make a decision. It's just to bring your attention to something feels disharmonious. There, that word right. comes in again. Not in harmony. Um, mm-hmm. And then if it's a repeating pattern, it becomes more relevant to pay attention to. You p- prioritize it a little bit higher on your list of things to contemplate. Then Mm -hmm. starting to pay attention to how your body is responding to this person. Mm -hmm. I just had a conversation with one of my friends. She like knows that she's not necessarily in the right relationship. And physically during sex, her body is responding in a negative way to this person Mm -hmm. by way of pain. So if you are, if you logically know the answer, but you're unsure, um, if it keeps coming up, there's more importance on it. And if your body is giving you clear indication that something doesn't feel right, uh, I would mm-hmm. say that is your definite sign that it's probably mm-hmm. time to move on. Okay. Okay. I'm looking at this, you know, um, with a with a few couples in life at the moment who have decided to go their separate ways. And what I've seen is there's a lot of trauma and a lot of stored, you know, uh, pain um, that then leads to you know bringing it full circle to you know where you started in terms of your journey of intimacy becoming mm-hmm. an intimacy therapist um, that then has led to physical you know ailments physical problems um, yeah. but they stay together for the sake of whatever you know fear um, f- fear um, society judgment condemnation etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but mm-hmm. actually what's happening is they're carrying that into into the world and then therefore their aura is one that's wounded. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For sure. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think even having conversations with people around uh, breaking up is not a bad thing, trying to help de- separate that uh, deeply ingrained belief um, that mm-hmm. separation equals being bad because it is negatively impacting not only your internal world, but everything that you encounter outside Mm. of you is affected by the vibration that you are carrying into it Mm. so that bubble affects everything um thank you so much it's been such a great conversation i'm i'm really excited that you've already mentioned a part two so we'll definitely (laughs) we'll definitely uh, do that um if 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 someone was uh, listening and they forwarded right to the end and they uh, just wanted to get the headlines, what would be your message to people when they're exploring um, intimacy? Yeah, being curious about your bubble, how your bubble impacts, um, you know, if you can say, I don't feel necessarily great today, see how everything else is affected by that um, state of being and then do your best to be curiously playful around how do I improve the feeling within my bubble so that I'm more open to connection and intimacy and experimenting with how others receive you when you simply just work on focusing on you feeling better first and foremost. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then having that as a strong foundation to work off. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Love it. I love. I love the idea of deep connection. I think you know we're on this. We're on this planet in whatever metaphysical state or however you know we can't. We haven't all worked it out. But I think it's really it's beautiful when you have those deep connections with people. And even if that's for a short period of time or a long period of time, you can see authentic connection, can't you? It, it stays with you. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much, Kat. Um, where you. can people find you online if they wanted to reach out or if they wanted to see what you're up to? Mm -hmm. Um, My website is intimacyacademy.org and my Instagram is cat underscore intimacy therapist. Um, I have lots of exciting new things coming up. I have a webinar, but um, those will be sprinkled out throughout the year. And I'm also running a intimate men's group. Um, Um. It's called Becoming the, uh, the Man She Can't Resist. 
And it's basically like creating a step-by-step process on helping men to develop skills to become and feel more desirable, feel more confident in navigating intimacy and connection with their woman. Amazing. When, when is that coming out? That will be, uh, we're launching it in September. And so my mm-hmm. sister, who is the wardrobe consultant, will also be on staff to go through men's closets with them and help them find <laughs> outfits that they feel very confident in. And right. yeah, so we're working on a whole internal, external transformative process. Amazing. And is that is that something that's in person? Is it virtual? Can people it's- uh, join? It's virtual. And then um, another opportunity that I'll have probably early next year is I'm moving to Costa Rica. Um, So I'll have in-person retreats where you can actually bring your partner or spouse to work on everything that we talked about today and develop a strong foundation of intimacy in a fun setting, like going on vacation, but being able to take home a lot of skills that can really help Mm. your relationship to thrive. Fantastic. Brilliant. Yeah. Lots of exciting things there. Yes. So um, they'll be all on my website. Um, okay. Check it out there. Brilliant. We'll put we'll put a little thing up here and we'll put it in the links in the description and things like that so people can find you really easily. Sounds Kat, good. I hate Thank to end you. the conversation. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I have lots of gratitude for you coming on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, if you're listening at home, uh, there's links in the description to everything that Kat's doing. Um, If you really struggle with intimacy, uh, we just want to say to you, take a step of courage, take a leap of faith, move forward and see how you can transform that area of your life. All right. So whatever you're doing, go encourage. Hey, so I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. I hope there was something in that for you to chew over, maybe disagree with, agree with, and really go on that journey of finding courage to build a stronger sense of intimacy with yourself and in your relationships. If you haven't already, please do hit that like button and subscribe to the channel to find out what's coming up and what we are doing. We have, yes, this is part of our relationship series, Um, And we do have our general courage conversations as well and a few other things coming up in the not too distant future as well. So hit that subscribe button. Um, When it comes to relationships, we are very interested in uh, having guests on the show that have some specialism in that. So if you have any questions around relationships, drop us an email, uh, get in touch by Instagram, via DMs, um, and visit the website for links on how to get in touch. Uh, And we'd be glad to pose those questions to our guests. All right, well, hope you enjoyed it. And whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, whatever you're going through, uh, my encouragement to you is to go forth in courage and see you on the next one.